Hello? Steven. Yeah. <coughs> Hang on. I'm gonna I'm I'm having to do on my phone. Sorry. Oh, yes, that's what I love. Sorry, I love being done on a phone. <laughs> Hang on. Oh. I also love technical difficulties. Oh, technical it's just see try and make actually living in the real modern world as difficult as possible. Hey, do you think by the year 2050 that these technical difficulties may not occur anymore? <laughs> Have you got Here me now? Go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fuck the stupid PC that I'm trying that they forced me to work on. Like <laughs> you spend your whole career on Mac and then you get some terrible job at a broadcaster and they force you to work on really crappy Macs. They just don't work, basically. That's fine. Um, yeah, so I've just I've got you on my little iPhone, but it works. Excellent. Right. So I'm just going to find a place to put it so I can just. Oh, I like that poster right behind me. I know. <laughs> you like my poster? I've actually just thought I better put that up so you don't see all these top secret, confidential new programs the ABC are making. Ooh. Show us the whiteboard. <laughs> it's so it's so exciting. Honestly, you'll be like, oh wow! But it's got loads of like you know, figures, boring costs of which programs cost what and stuff like that. So I thought I'd give you a war and waste background, which just says 8 million, can you read it? Yeah, 8 million tons, plastic end up in the ocean each year. Yeah. Amazing. Good to meet you, Steve. Good to meet you, Ryan. How are you, mate? Yeah, good, thank you. I've heard all about you. I'm looking forward to chatting with you today. Yeah, you too. Sorry about my technical fuck-ups. I apologise for that. But now I think we're... How's that? It was meant to be an under-18 podcast, but I think you just ruined it. Oh, sorry. Are you recording already? <laughs> oh, no. Disaster. We'll start yes. again. <laughs> Hi, guys. So great to meet you. Hi. Good to meet you, Hi, too. Right. Yeah, well, yeah. Let's just start at, hey, how are you feeling today after uh, backing up after winning the Actor Award for Best Documentary Series for War and Waste? Yeah, good. It was it was a big... Uh, it was just, you know, one of those things where you put a huge amount of effort in and it's great for the team to actually have a, like, one night of celebration after a year of, like, relentless campaigning and slogging. So, yeah, we're a little bit... We've been a little bit dusty this week, but you have to celebrate the wins, you know? That's what gives you the energy to keep going, is, to, is if you actually have those, those blowouts where you can go, you know what, we did okay there. Does ABC we, pay for drinks? Uh, a few, not enough. <laughs> not in the quantity required for celebration. Not in the quantity that was quite seriously required, but yeah, I mean, we had a ticket to go to the actors, and it, that was a, it, it was good. It was it was a big event, and it's just it's what I liked about the actors is it was just a kind of peer, it's your recognition of your peers as a pe that that was a piece of television that is being recognised as a really effective, really excellent bit of TV that worked. You know, there's been a, we. We also got nominated for other awards. We won two banks here, sustainability awards. So what I love about Warren Waits is the show that's worked for both like sustainable communities and like impact, uh, you know, beyond television, but it's also kind of been recognized as a piece of really good piece of television. So that for me is the holy grail, you know, it's, it's, it's good television, but it at the entertains, but it also had a big impact beyond that. So it's just been really nice to have one of those projects that in, that's in the sweet spot, you know? Yeah. And what do you mean by impact? Uh, well, it's just had a huge impact on on the communities that have got behind it. Like um, we've had a really big, successful campaign ban the bag. I mean, as you can see, like yeah. wherever it is, there. Yeah. You know, we. Um, and that came like, out of War and Waste. Yeah. Well, one of the big stories in War and Waste was how we need to ban plastic bags, or at least just re dramatically reduce the amount that we use, because yeah. they just every bit of plastic that we have created in the world still exists, right? Yeah. And we use them to carry our, our, our food from the supermarket to our car for like, yeah. you know, three you minutes know, and then it lasts for thousands of years. Plastic bags, I, I like this one because I, I, I actually wrote a blog post a few years ago about plastic bags, which became the most talked about um, comment on Cora, which was oh, really? why plastic bags are good for the environment, <laughs> which was really just to get traction and it was clickbait. <laughs> But, but my <laughs> that, argument that was, was your, is that you That got was these, your blog. You called it Why Plastic Bags Are Good for the Environment. Yeah, there was the blog post name. But the, my argument was that you're banning a bag and then you're going to the supermarket and buying 50 bags and you're that same person who's happy to have their reusable bag 
would have bought the carrots in a bag if they were cheaper and the tomatoes in a bag if they were cheaper, then going and picking their own tomatoes and not putting them in a bag. And then and then everyone then the same guys who produced the bags probably just went and produced paper bags and also started selling plastic reusable bags. <laughs> that was my argument. <laughs> which I feel like a good 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 thing to get us going for today, because you've probably got a different view on it. Yeah, I have a different view. I mean, you know, like the 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 less plastic we can use in general has got to be good, right? Because yeah. plastic is, you know, it was invented in like fifties or something. We just didn't used to. Our grandparents never had plastic. We don't need. Yeah. We don't. You know, we feel like we cannot live without it anymore, and it's incre- incredibly convenient. But we don't actually need it. It's not an essential product for life. And how do and you that, how do you see us getting not using it as in plastic packaging? Um, well, that you just, but you, that you, for example, the supermarkets, you go to some of the sort of health food stores or sort of enlightened stores where people actually, you know, everything's in like giant glass jars and you just weigh it out how yeah. much you want and then you put it in your canvas bag or your own glass jars yeah. or whatever, the, yeah. the, your, whatever reusable containers. It's really not that hard. It's more about just the habit. It's going, oh, I'm going to go to the shop, so I'll take my bags with me. Rather than just wandering home and going, oh, I might pop in at the shop. You know, yeah. like, it, it's about just actually kind of knowing yourself. It actually is empowering to know yourself and yeah. actually, not, you know, make a plan and go, well, I'm just going to do that. And, uh, and I guess one of the big things that I was going to talk to you guys about, which is something that that Warren Waste was a really good example of, especially actually the coffee cup story, but yeah. the plastic bags is the same is that if you can make a really low barrier to entry for people to join your campaign, if it can be really easy for them to join, it costs very little or nothing, it's not very difficult, it, it, you know, it's, you don't have to overthink it. If you can just get yourself a reusable coffee cup or a reusable, I've got a few here I can show you, Vegemite jar, for example. Mm, I yeah. like that one. <laughs> is that a courtesy of Catfish Creative? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It actually isn't from Catfish Creative, but she knows all about it. It's actually from, you know, my impact producer on Warren White and nice. Marks. It's good we to see Vegemite getting this. behind it. It's Vegemite, you know. As long as you can scrub the, the smell of Vegemite out of the jar, which is yeah. easier said than done, to be honest. Um, but beyond that, you know, like, it's such an easy thing to just have one of these. Yeah, so yeah, easy. Yeah. And, and suddenly you feel you're part of the community. And yeah. you'll have a conversation at the, at the cafe. The barista will say, oh, that's cool. Where did you get that? So, oh, it's a Vegemite jar. You know, yeah. the kids finished it, washed it out. And suddenly you feel like you're part of the community and without having made much effort. And you're having conversations started about it. Other people will overhear in the queue. It, like, just suddenly becomes this really... Um, this it just this mushrooming community and plastic bags is the same thing. Like you take your canvas bags and it might say something where you've been or blah blah blah. It's just not the grey ones you get from Woolies that everyone yeah, yeah. that are really boring and really damaging. So it, it suddenly creates a community that it becomes very easy to become a part of and it it's much easier for it to grow and grow and grow. Yeah, I like it. It's great. And I agree. Yeah. It's one of those things that I have so many conversations over my reusable bags that have you know swear words on them or weird pictures <laughs> yeah and people love it yeah people love it and yeah. you can customize them it's the same it's like it, you know it's suddenly it's like it's taking away that kind of homogenous sort of everyone's the same that robotic kind of humanity we, i think that's one of the challenges that we're going to face is like this idea that you know we should celebrate individuality we should celebrate difference we should celebrate that that was another of the big campaigns in war and waste was like you know Size doesn't matter. Give ugly a go. You know, like the fruit and vegetables all being this kind of perfect shape, yeah. perfect size, no blemish, all that stuff. It's like, actually, that's really not what we should celebrate. And in, if you translate that into, you know, they are organisms that are growing, that are alive on plants. Yeah. And, and if you translate that into human society, it's the last thing we want is everyone to be the same. And and actually, I actually started thinking about this after speaking to Laura just briefly. I was thinking, well, I did a series about meat, where our meat comes from. Yeah. And one of the big things that we tried to get through to the audience was that every single chicken, every single of the 7 million chickens that are eaten in Australia every week, you know, when you see those factories, it's mind-boggling. Yeah. They're all, they're all individuals, just like yeah. we are. Yeah. They actually have a personality. They, they, you know, they are different. And yeah. we just try and make them look the same. And when you do that to 
you know, you just it, it's it's actually barbaric what we're doing to try and to try and make everything the same. And how boring! Do we really want the world where everything but, is uniform? That's a good point. But the, uh, carry on on the point. Isn't the reason that we made everything the same was to make it more efficient to use more less energy? You know, like a good example in New Zealand is when they standardise all the checks in New Zealand. They only had to produce one size check. One truck would go pick up every type of check, and all the banks collaborated. And it was very efficient. You could process a check in one week, and there was only one truck that would go pick up all checks in New Zealand. Where, yeah. when there are multiple checks, you had six different trucks driving down the road for every single bank, and they're all being processed on different days. And so it wasn't a standardised operation, which meant that it was less efficient and there was more energy to be used. Yeah, I think that's a good point. But that obviously, the um, that's just the different trucks, right? It doesn't matter. I mean, chickens are always going to be a roughly about the same size. But I don't think that actual yeah. example, was, you know, that was more about the economies of trans, the economics of transportation okay. than than actually the individuality being allowed from the from the chicken. But the but the overall point is valid, which is how do we actually do something efficiently for an ever growing population? How do we actually kind of manage the economies of scale to make you know, chicken affordable and give yeah. people the high high class protein at an affordable price for on the scale of, of, and the quantity that we need it. So that is a good point. And uh, yeah. and, uh, and but I, but I think beyond that is is um, I, I accept that we should try and make things as affordable as possible and give everybody a higher quality of life. But what what I'm about is going. I don't. I'm not trying to stop people eating meat or stop people being able to. Um, you know, eat fish and chips or whatever. It's not. It's not about that. It's about just understanding the processes that go into getting that to you. Yeah. If you're and if you're informed, like Laura was involved in a, in a in a show I worked on called What's the Catch, and we launched a big campaign off the back of that called Label My Fish, and that yeah. was all about. We we're not trying to say don't eat fish, don't catch wild fish. We're just saying you've got to know the species that you're eating. And if you know the species, you know how fast it can reproduce, you know the fish stocks, and you can make a, you can then use that information to make a choice yeah. so, so that you'll choose to eat fish that is actually sustainable in years to come. And that was a really big campaign that I worked on in, in about four years, three or four years ago now. We just had, so a, a, well, we just yeah. had a conversation over lunch about <laughs> kind of that same thing, and Ryan was like, well... I mean, I don't sit here and think about where my corned beef came from. I just eat it. And yeah, like we were talking about how you know those conscious consumer questions aren't always there, but that's kind of what you try to aim and target at, and like informing people that they need to be a conscious consumer. Yeah, just actually knowing, like, actually, knowledge is actually really empowering, right? It's exciting. It's genuinely yeah. thrilling to actually know stuff. You know, ignorance is really actually it's just not cool i think to be yeah. ignorant it's it, it's actually and when you when when you know, when you actually know where your things that you own whether that's food or clothes or whatever when you actually have some sense of what went into getting that to you it's actually really exciting it makes you, you genuinely feel better so it's, i think a lot of these things are all are all tied up in an empowering individual but yeah with with fish it was a it's a it, I mean, everything's different. The fish, it's a different story, right? Because we still eat more wild fish than we eat farm fish. And we need to be aware that wild fish growing, you know, they live in the ocean. If we keep taking the amount of wild fish out, there's just not going to be any left in 20 years. So is it okay to eat farm fish? It's totally okay to eat farm fish. Yeah. But it's, it, but it's also what type of fish do you farm? You, we need, what we need to do is get much better at farming herbivorous fish. So fish that actually eat algae and seaweed and plants. And what's the salmon an example of that type of fish? No, salmon's a carnivorous fish. So salmon has to be fed protein. It normally eats okay. other fish. So salmon is not actually the, really the right species that we should be farming. We're now farming it on massive, yeah, on yeah. a massive scale. And it's I always talk kind of you talk you talk about it in a kind of traffic light scenario: red, amber, green. Salmon is a classic amber. It's not that bad, but it's not that good either. You no. know, like it's. There's a lot of problems. So what's with green? Salmon what's farming. like the best three greens? The best, well, so, so sustainable wild fish is the best. Things like sardines, you know, okay. small, small pelagic fish that are large in number, high in protein, really good for you, full of those omega threes, really nice, and and they're they are a sort of prey a prey fish, so they're actually designed to be in huge numbers and be eaten. But what we tend to do is we fish all the sardines and then feed them to the tuna that are kind of ranched in giant tuna pens 
Yeah. And, 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 but those tuna are, are what are captured from the wild. And, and bluefin tuna, for example, the stuff that's, that, that swims off the coast of South Australia, is down to 4% of its original biomass, which is like 4% of the tuna that, that there should be in the ocean is still in the ocean. And that's like, normally when a, when a species is under 10, it's critically endangered, you know, like, we're, like tuna, there could well be no more tuna by 2050. But we're still fishing point. the hell out of it. So we still fish it, yeah. and we still. And if you don't fish it, you don't have a say in its protection. Like that's the kind of crazy rules that that are that are around. If you don't actually, if you're not part of the international fishing community on tuna, you're yeah. not allowed a seat at the table to decide how much you can fish. I mean, the insanity of that. It's is crazy. Just, it's the same in the agri industry, though, isn't it? Place six, sugar water. Yeah, you got to be in it to win it. It's like yeah. you know what you you got to be kind of. Now they're advisors because they know everything about the industry, so they're the best people to talk about. Yeah. It's like having it's like having a boardroom of foxes deciding what to do with the hen house. Yeah, that's a good way. That's a good analogy, actually. <laughs> it's like my, going, my oh no, fox. but I'm not a fox. I'm a rabbit. I don't really want to eat the hens. Oh, well, sorry, we're not interested in your opinion. We only want people to, that, that actually really want to get in the hen house and eat them all. Yeah, that's great. It's, that's a great line. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, do you think we'll be still eating fish by 2050, or we will be eating farm fish? Well, I think, like, we'll, be, I think we'll be. I think we'll be eating farm fish. I mean, in yeah. Asia, like agriculture, we pretty much fish. already are with salmon, right? Like I'd say, a lot of people eat salmon as a staple food now, and it's no ninety-nine percent farmed. Yeah, salmon. Salmon in Australia is all farmed. I mean, there's yeah. no salmon. There's no wild salmon here. Well, there's Pacific salmon, which is a different species to Atlantic salmon, which is the stuff we all eat. And so and do you all still eat that, fish? All of that stuff. Yeah, I eat fish. I, yeah. I mean, I try and eat sustainable fish as much as possible without being completely friendless, No, never be invited to a barbecue ever again. <laughs> <if I'm laughs> Bore. <bull. laughs> you know, so, I, you know, I have to, I feel like you have to be flexible. So my wife is a marine biologist, so she knows a lot about this stuff too. Yeah. So, you know, together at home, we know what fish to eat. But and we, I don't think you go and tell. At the barbecues, are, are you preaching to everyone about fish at the same time? Well, again, it's about how much can people stand. Yeah. <laughs> can well, they stand it's, Stephen it's, it's, slapping it's, them in the face with a fish? Yeah, <laughs> it's about, you can't, you can't, you can, there's only so much people can tolerate being told what they can and can't eat. They actually want to talk about the cricket or the football or, hey, you know. On, on that then, in terms of talking to people and, and telling them how you feel, do you find that's easier or do you find it's easier through the work that you do with producing documentary series? Like oh, series? Uh, it's much easier. I find it much I mean, you know, I make docu- I don't make documentaries to make lots of money. I make documentaries because I really care about the storytelling and the message, right? I'm never going to be a very rich person making documentaries, and I don't care about that. So I genuinely care. So I, as a person, I like to talk about it too. But I'm, I, it's much easier to just go, if you're interested in stuff, watch the film. And then people watch the film, and then they want to talk more because they've got interested. But, yeah, I, I think I wouldn't have nearly as many friends if I was if I just bang on about it all the time I just I, I kind of rather point people in the direction of the film and then just have a laugh when you're not working otherwise you just you, I just make myself silly if, I, if yeah, I was yeah. making films about it all day and then only talking about it at night too but yeah. but there's a lot of people these days and I find it's an increasing number of people are just really getting more and more passionate about the sort of stuff that you guys are doing yeah. well, you know what can we all do can we just have a conversation about the future and how to actually be a part of leaving the earth in a place that our kids are going to be okay in. You know? So I've got, I've got a question, because there's three trains of thought, and I get asked it all a lot. Some people say we need governments to like lobby and say ban the plastic bag, right, for us to stop using plastic bags. Yeah. Some people say that we make people more conscious and then they'll stop using plastic bags. So yeah, yeah. And then the third realm is, is that companies will come out and design something so good that plastic bags will be obsolete by 250. Yeah. Do you think... Well, I mean, the obvious answer is all of the above. We need all of it. I mean, we need all the help we can get, to be honest. And so, you know, we need the government to come and regulate, stop using plastic bags, and if you are going to use them, pay more for them, right? That's like a a classic regulation model. We need that. But we also need people to understand why it's a bad idea to buy plastic bags and keep using them. So that's like raising the awareness. Yeah. And then, of course, we need the ingenuity. We need the brilliant minds. We need the technological innovation. We need the, the, that that kind of brilliance that comes from, often from big big business, sometimes from just geniuses. We we need that to go. Well, actually, this is a more economical way of doing it, and it's more 
sustainable and more environmentally friendly. So we need all three of those pincer movements that you talked about, Ryan, happening yeah. at the same ha- happening at the same time. And, and so, if, if one and if one of them doesn't work, then we're we're screwed. So with the plastic bags, for example, and we'll get into coffee next, but the obviously the government started lobbying, right? Well, people started to become conscious from the war on waste, but also the government started changing. Was there, is there innovation in the market as well that you've seen that's actually been scalable innovation? In, in plastic, are you talking about specifically in plastic bags? Just specifically plastic bags for now, because obviously people became conscious of, and also governments started lobbying against it, right? And, yeah, I mean, and the big I mean, supermarket but, said no. Yeah. I mean, is it innovation or no? It's just a reusable bag. You know what? Bag. In plastic bags, I've seen less exciting innovation, I'd yeah. say. Than, I mean, there was, it was more like instead of actually coming up with brilliant new ideas to replace plastic, people have kind of found loopholes in the regulation, like making thicker plastic bags because oh, it, yeah, it, yeah. it applied to single use. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, single use was deemed to be a certain thickness, so if you made your plastic bags thicker, then you could carry on Well, that's a good point. It. Mm. It's like Which is a really interesting point. It, like, should be, it should be like it can go on a dishwasher and not mount or something like that. <laughs> should be the actual legislation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then you're kind of like, hang on, that plastic's going to cause just as much, if not more, will last even longer, even more millennia. You know, so... The <laughs> thing, I think there's more interesting developments in things like, you know... Um, I've seen, you know, you've probably seen them too, these videos going around social media of like water balls that are made out of a kind of rice membrane that you can yeah. just go, you know, so instead of having a plastic ball that you can just, have like yeah, a yeah. ball of water in an edible membrane. But, um, so, but like in bags, does that mean there's an opportunity in bags to go design something, do you think? And do you think in 2050 someone would have designed something? Yes, and yes. Yeah. I think there's definitely an opportunity, and I think by 2050, I hope someone's grabbed that opportunity and nailed it. Totally. I, I agree. I mean, I, I think we need scientists and engineers and brilliant minds who, are, who, who can actually come up and think outside yeah. the box. And so, yeah, I would urge young designers to keep thinking about that and work yeah. out ways. Because you're right. I mean, one of the amazing things about the future, without doubt, is we, we, we humans are pretty remarkable. We have an ability to be resilient, to actually to, you know, miss, what do they say? Necessity is the mother of invention. So, like, when you need something, you know, that focuses the mind and you actually... I always found this, like, when you become... A, when you become a, when I became a new a dad for the first time, not too long ago, you kind of... Um, you suddenly go, shit, I've got to get my shit together. I've actually yeah. got to... You know, you're like, oh, God, I'm a freelance documentary filmmaker. And, you know, and then when you suddenly become a parent, you're like, well, I have no choice now. I am providing yes. for family. And you actually start to get quite good at it because yeah. you have no choice. It's like, That's, right. That's interesting. You know, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I feel, I feel like it's a bit the same when you go, actually, we've run out of fish. Yeah. So we've got to do something. But what I don't want, I, I've, got some, I've got some friends. I went to a quite a conventional university in the UK that, that, that a lot of people who went to that university didn't end up as filmmakers, musicians and artists. They ended up as bankers, lawyers and doctors. So I've got quite a few friends in that conventional world. Yeah. And, I, and I've actually had conversations from people who are, you know, my age, uh, who say things like, in terms of like, you know, fossil fuels, well, why don't we just, you know, you don't go to a party and save some of the beer. You drink, you drink the beer till it runs dry and then think of something else to drink. I like that. <laughs> I was just like, that is just, that I'm terrified. But, but that is a mentality. It's yeah, like, hang yeah, on, yeah. There's, oil, there's still oil reserves. Let's just use them. Well, I, I just want to uh, stop you there because at one point going back is that you're saying that, um, you know, the adversity essentially... At some point, you don't have any choice, so you have to change, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> it reminds me of something someone said to me the other day, which was that, that why capitalism is good is that when you got adversity or you can't solve a problem, the adversity means you become creative to solve the problem, and the reward yeah. is the capitalism, right? Which you yeah. don't get the same drive of all these problems happening when you're in a, you know, I'm going to say socialist, but a community that's supporting you because you don't have any adversity to drive you to go actually make a change because it's like you just keep on going and dealing with the issue, which is kind of the same thing, which is just a point I wanted to make around it. Um, yeah. 
Well, uh, uh, do you mean like? Do you mean like if you've got a really well-run, well-managed, sustainable, equitable society where everyone's happy and flourishing, and creativity is, is is encouraged, and you actually use your resources in a sustainable way? I don't think I mean, it's that's, as easy you to don't, be creative. You don't need to. You don't need to work very hard on on coming up with new innovations. Yeah, it's not. It's not as you're not. You're not forced into creativity as into a different creative state. I don't think. Yeah, I mean, God, wouldn't that be a wonderful utopian <laughs> ideal to actually be able to test that? But until we can, yeah. you know, <laughs> there's a lot to work on still, you know. Yeah. Well, how is, um, how is working on these kind of social impact docos changed you or, you know, the way you live your life? Um, there is no choice now. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm not allowed to be spotted anywhere near the ABC building with a disposable coffee cup. Otherwise, yeah. I'm just like... I'm Do you think you will use one in the next 10 years or like a disposable coffee cup? I have actually used one. I, when, yeah. I was at the, when I was at swimming with my kids on a Saturday morning after not enough sleep on the Friday and I hadn't brought it with me and I knew that there was no one that really knew me and I, uh, <laughs> I had... A, I used Did you feel guilty though? Cup. I didn't really feel guilty until someone I actually knew... Oh, someone uh, busted me <laughs> and said, "What's it? What's it worth?" A photo going. Oh, here's the hypocrite with the disposable <laughs> coffee cup. So, uh, you know what? I kind of did the second time. I realised I had. I was at, again at swimming where there's this sort of cafe. I was like, "Oh, that's not." I can. You know what? You, everyone can make an, ex- an exception every now and then. And uh, but but yeah, I I tried. Now I just try not to at all anywhere. But you know, uh, as I said, I mean, part of me. This is a probably a bit of a frank probably an unflattering admission of myself i guess but i'm prepared to make it for you guys Thanks. and that is that um part of me goes you know what i do my bit i spend my whole bloody life trying to make documentaries that do all this so i bought yeah. myself a few credit points if i am um, <laughs> if i need if i want to fly away somewhere on holiday or if i want to you know eat a burger once in a while yeah. you know like i kind of you know, I, and that's just pure self-justification. It doesn't really mean anything, and it does, and it's not not. It's probably not really the right way to think. But it, yeah, it's, it's totally called the law of the commons, me. isn't it? It's like, and it's they always use the analogy of the farmer next to me just got one more sheep, so I'll get one more too. And the other one's yeah. like, oh, he just got one more, and then now you got three sheep on those farms, <laughs> and before you know it, everyone's got more sheep because they all thought they'd just get one more. And, yeah. and they do the same with energy, right? And India uses less energy than America per capita. So they argue that we should, we've should we still got mm-hmm. another 50% more we could use and we're still half of what you're using in America per capita so we can actually use 50% more and we're still doing good. <laughs> you know, rather yeah. than us all using less. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, I mean, you're absolutely right. That is a, so I don't, I think you're right. It's about being and trying to lead by example and actually give people a, a, some idea of, yeah, yeah, actually. But it's very, to, very difficult to, to be conscious all the time, especially if you're tired, right? Yeah, and you can't beat yourself up all the time either. No, you can't beat yourself up. I think you just got to be true to your own values, right? Just know what your values are and feel like you can defend those. And and uh, you know, so yeah, I still, I still, own, I still own a car. I drive a car. I mean, I, yeah. I ride my bike, and my wife rides her bike every day. We ride our bikes to work and back, but we still have a car just to, yeah, yeah. When we, when, to use, and we still do eat. Um, you know, when we're at someone else's house, we're not going to make a fuss and make them feel bad. You know, generally we eat the right kind of stuff. But if at we, one point, we, did you though? You're like, oh, sorry, I can't eat to fish. Uh, it's not sustainably farmed. Did you know that? And then your wife looked at you, and then yeah, we we yeah we've had a we've had a few moments like that. So oh, I've yeah. now made right. I've made some, I've made a film about fish, a film about meat. A, you know, a whole film about packaging and plastic. Yeah. But I also made a film about um, wine, the history of Australian wine. It was called Chateau Chanda, okay. which is a Monty Python. Monty mm-hmm. Python, you, 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 you guys are probably too young to even know what that is. I know. Anyway, it's a really it famous <laughs> famous comedy group from the 70s in the UK. Anyway, they took the piss out of Australian wine, calling it Chateau Chanda, really. like. <laughs> well, look, it's, pretty, it's kind of on, on point with my childhood anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Anyway, and that involved me going around. That was a really fun project. It was about telling, just telling this great story that Australian winemakers were the first to actually go, wow, is that Chardonnay? We're going to write Chardonnay on the bottle instead of the wanky French like geographical domain name that means nothing to 99% of us. Oh, we're going to call it Chardonnay. We're going to call it Shiraz. And we're going to put a screw cap on so the court doesn't screw it up. And, you know, they democratize wine. But Anyway, as a result of going on this sort of... And they call it Yellow Tail. Well. And Sheptek the Yellow Tail. <laughs> what a brilliant bit of marketing. You know, like, yeah, yeah. that's just the Aussie wine. It tastes the same everywhere. There's 4,000 bottles every hour produced, but it tastes the same. Oh, really? Yeah. It's an interesting so, point. You know, someone just told me the other day that um, there's more millionaires in China than there are the population of Australia <laughs> and New Zealand yeah, combined. Yeah, right. There you go. And they're getting really in there because they... All they can get is pretty much yellowtail and no yellow nice tail. wine. Oh, they're all they'll they're just all, say Chardonnay and have screw tops, and they actually want cork screws in the actual location of that wine. <laughs> yeah, and they're making like they're making like counterfeit wine in China. As well. Oh, really? Interesting. Well, they counterfeit Gucci and Prada yeah, yeah. and everything why else. Not do they, wine. Count, they counterfeit grains. You know the famous Australian wine yeah. that's like a thousand bucks a bottle. They make <laughs> fake. They make fake grains with a bit with a that has got spelling mistake. <laughs> but anyway just to finish that story so i've kind of made this wine film my wife says god this is you've actually almost crippled us and we now can't drink any cheap shit wine can't eat any cheap basic fish can't eat any cheap meat can't eat any, uh, can't have any coffee. disposable coffee cups can't use plastic bags. it's like you're crippling our lifestyle completely and we have no in the friends name of, it's true though it's true and there's so many friends. elements that it's quite hard it's 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 it's, it's kind of draining isn't it it's like, yeah. <laughs> and I wonder how our grandparents actually, if they actually enjoyed life or as much as we did, or we do. <laughs> do you think they do? Or they do? Uh, yeah, I reckon they do because you know what? You don't know how the world is going to turn out in the future. So you enjoy, you know, like, you, you know, there were optimists and pessimists back then. There were people yeah. who had a brilliant time. There was no phones and there was no central heating and in the UK that's a big deal for us yeah. the central heating was this massive thing that came in yeah. our grandparents never had any of those luxuries there was not, no affordable air travel you couldn't fly around the world you know like we you know I grew up in the UK and my wife grew up in Barcelona in Spain and we're now we're you know we're kind of the product of this globalized world where we had all the opportunities everything was like totally affordable we could have education anywhere and we got well educated but we kind of chose to live in Australia basically because it's hot and sunny and beautiful and there's incredible beaches and we both love diving in the ocean and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But what, what's happened now is that we're, you know, our kids are growing up on the other side of the world to their grandparents. Yeah. So suddenly our chickens have come home to roost. Like when you make those choices, but it's really about you. Our grandparents didn't have those problems. No. They grew up, you know, they were there and they, they were happy because they're, you know, like they, they were with their parents and they had grandparents and, you know, there was a system that actually worked where they grew a lot more of their own food and they, you know, like that. You know, I think there was a bit. There was more sustainable. They were genuinely sustainable without even knowing they were sustainable. Yeah. Well, well, say like in 2050, there's very good possibility you could be a grandfather by then. By the time your kids, yes. like, you know, your kids will be late 30s by then. What yeah. sort of a world do you think you're going to be living in as a grandparent? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I'm terrified that they'll do what we did and just disappear to the other side of the world because it will take half an hour to get to London or, you know, or, you know, like you'd just be able to teleport or, you know, my little son's reading Harry Potter and they like, apparate, which is like, I suddenly realised an apparition, something just appears and to apparate is this kind of what the wizards do when they just want to go somewhere, you know, immediately they just yeah. apparate, you know, that's what Harry Potter learns to do. I was like, fuck it. Ooh. I was like, imagine if... Um, Imagine if we could apparate to places, and that's that's probably a reality that we can actually, we'll be able to go go wherever we want with much less. Um, hopefully, and I, hopefully, hopefully, won't be burning fossil fuels to get. I there. think apparate like, is actually the word of our like grandparents' generation. You know, like it was like apparating stuff easier, faster, and better, which is like for only five bucks, you know, only half an hour of your wages, you can have a burger. With products shipped across the world, and you can cook, you can be a king, right? And have any burger you want, and they'll yeah. make it for you. And you won't even have to cook, you won't have to even kill an animal. And all you have to do is sit down for 10 minutes, pay half of your hour's wages, and you've got a burger. And so that yeah. was apparating burgers almost, you could say. And the next phase might be what we have right now, which is Deliveroo, who's apparating or Uber Eats. You know, Uber Eats, McDonald's you see all those ads, and they just sit there going, Tonight yeah. I'm going to eat. In the, and it just so appears. Do you think the there's going to be right. some, 
you know, big, you know, large Australian guy on high wages and not having to plumb a house in 2050 and he'll still be eating a burger that was delivered to his door and he'll be drinking it with a disposable cup and then he'll just put it outside and let it go. You know what? Yeah, I think I think I mean there's basic biology, right? There's biology that we need that, that we all, you know, need to eat. I think we'll I think we're all going to live a lot a lot longer, and that's clearly what's happened. And I think that is a challenge, right? That that idea of keeping this quality of life till a lot longer. So we're going to live till we're 120, but we're going to yeah. expect we're going to expect to be playing tennis till we're 110 or whatever, yeah. or swim, you know, all that kind of idea, which is going to I think I, for me, I, what I'm concerned about is the big things are like the resources, the food and water resources. But I think technology will transform that. But the health, the challenges around the health, the health, you know, like yeah. how we're actually going to keep ourselves alive. And um, yeah, I think they are really important challenges. And Do I you, think it's not it's not too far away that we're, that the Earth is, is unlikely to be the only planet. I think it's true that it's the best planet currently. I think yeah. astronomers say that, but it's probably not going to be the only planet we have it in in fifty years time. Um, like in in your travels, because obviously you've gone through these all these different industries, you know, seafood, meat, you know, packaging, renewable wine. energy. Do you feel like yeah. there's um. Is it is it is it monopolized in each industry where there's like one guy or one family or one company that's pretty much controlling most of that market? That no, not not no, not what from what I've seen at all. No, no. I think I think I think it's much less. It's much more egalitarian from what I can see. It's the, the, and I think that's partly because renewable energy, for example, is a really interesting point because um, there's, there have been quite major subsidies from governments all over the world to. Um, to invest in renewable energy, and that by almost by definition that means that they, that's regulated. Who gets those subsidies? It's not been a kind of free for all capitalist entrepreneur that's actually. And, and at the end of the day, you know, we're actually getting energy from the sun and from the wind, and there's no way that you can own the sun. The sun comes into your garden, it comes into my garden, it comes into the next door neighbor's garden. It's like that's where the energy comes from. You've got to build the infrastructure of the solar yeah. panels and the converters and all that but um so no, i think no i think it's been it feels like it's more much more egalitarian i think the fish is really interesting because you can't build fences underwater but you you know whereas in, on farming when you with meat yeah it's much easier to go this is my land and these are my cows and you can't eat those yeah that's a bit that's that's a bit different but i'd regard meat as still as an old school it's an old school it's growing still but it, it's on the old school model as opposed to renewable energy Interesting. And so how do you see renewable meat? Well, I did quite a lot of research because I really wanted to tell a story about, you know, petri dish meat that didn't involve cruelty-free meat. So not cruelty-free products, which is vegan yeah. stuff, but cruelty-free meat. So it actually has that same delicious flavor and you get the same texture and you can cook it. But it's still much, much further off than I thought it would be, you know. Yeah. Like, and I'm not talking about corn or, you know, tofu burgers or anything. I'm actually talking about animal cells that are grown in the lab. They actually are animal. They're animal. Yeah, I think yeah. they were doing that in New York, weren't they, or over in the states? Was, yeah, they're like... doing it, but they have not been. A, I think that has got a long way to go. Still, it's nowhere near ready to be rolled out. And I think by 2050, that's going to be an exciting, an exciting. Um, development that yeah. actually will be, we actually will be able to eat delicious burgers and we'll be able to eat them guilt free without if, you, if you're an animal lover you know well, yeah by 2050 we're like i mean it's predicted that there's going to be nine over nine billion people on the planet so yeah with everything that you've looked at across fish and meat and even plastic like what does that look like to you with all those more mouths to feed and people consuming more well, I think the big thing that we clearly need to do is all of us need to eat more plants and grow more of our own. It's actually really, I mean, I'm a hopeless gardener. I'm really, really terrible. I can kill any plant. I mean, look at my plant, the poor thing. Nice. <laughs> but I've, I mean, I've, it's just about alive. I kind of give it water whenever I remember once a month or something. But... but in fact, I'm going to give it some now. You've it's kind of funny me. how your wife grows under underwater plants and she can keep those alive. You can't even keep yeah. 
but you neither of us can like. neither of us can keep anything alive in our garden at all. It's an absolute disgrace. But my point is, we need to eat a lot more plant plant foods, definitely, yeah. and we and and it's really not that hard to grow it yourself, grow your own. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think that that is a big a really big step that we can all make. And I know there's lots of entrepreneurs now working on this thing where you can actually, you know, making it idiot proof. Not instead of Hello no, Fresh where they deliver the food, they deliver the plant and the box and the soil and you can tap it into apps with your phone that actually tell you water it now or tomorrow and you tick it off. So you can almost the the, the real idiot's guide to growing tomatoes on your balcony. I've always been surprised now on see up a business where they literally gone to every building in Sydney, for example, and set up a garden on every roof, free land, you know, in the, at some point you'd have drones delivering it all. Yeah. It's I mean, like, it, it seems it, when like I was, an easy business opportunity. You know, you don't have to pay rent. All I you totally have is your set costs. Get the company to pay the set costs. I offer, offer half the vegetables to them. I tell you, mate, you've, so that's it. You've sorted. <laughs> See you later. I'm off to do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but when I was, when I was going, I was doing this, climate change stuff about renewable energy and stuff um i went to paris and in paris they have a new rule that all new buildings have to have either a green top or solar oh. panel um solar panel the the glass so glass in office buildings now are all in modern Solid. office buildings now are all photovoltaic panels crazy yeah it's great so like which is great and you actually can't get a permit or to um to, to do any kind of property development in Paris without without actually making your your building carbon neutral. So that's a brilliant that's a brilliant thing. Yeah, yeah. It just it doesn't scale as quickly as it, it you'd think it would. Maybe because it's the French doing it, it was America doing it. Maybe everyone else would be doing it. <laughs> yeah, know. no, I agree. But that but you know there are places like that that are you know the whole there's this province called um, Schleswig Holstein I think it's called in Germany this big province in the north of Germany that's also 100% renewable. The whole province is 100% renewable now. That's like right. there are there, there are significant things happening around the yeah, world yeah. that are that are actually giving us genuine excitement and hope for the future. And I think. Um, uh, you know, we are. I think we're going to be all right. We're going to get there. It's going to be yeah. a bit bumpy, but we're 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 going to get there. And there's more and more people doing what you guys are doing, just actually genuinely interested in what we can do. You know, it's not just entertainment. It's not just telling jokes and being stupid. It's actually like let let's actually do some fun stuff. What were, What were your people. biggest like tipping points out of all these docos? Like things that you like literally stopped doing and you didn't realize. You weren't conscious of. You're like, wow, can't believe I was. Just been doing that for the last ten years. Uh, uh, that's a good question. It's a hard one, I guess. Um, I mean, for me, it's been gradual. I mean, I started making, I started my career making natural history films in the UK. Like, I just love animals and the natural world, so I started just doing that. But then I kind of came to Australia, and I just made. I, I actually realised that I made a whole load of films about social history in Australia, but it was subconsciously, it was about trying to understand the culture in Australia, like actually learn. I made films about Skippy the Bush Kangaroo, you know, like that, and learn, learn what that meant and what that was about the national, the identity, national identity of Australia. So yeah. I kind of was just schooling myself in the culture and learning how to make messages that would resonate in Australia, I guess. And then get back, and then I kind of got back into doing this kind of stuff about the, the meat show and the fish show. And, and it was for me. It's been a sort of slow realization, and and it and it ties into a lot of things. And for, I just feel like if you've got a purpose or a mission, if you feel like you're making this is the word I use, and this is I did a whole sort of test on what my values were, and I think it's a really important thing to do. Like the number one thing for me was making a contribution. Like that is the and that is the single for me the single most important driver is I feel like if if you feel like you're making a contribution then you are almost guaranteed robust mental health. Like, mental, there's a mental health crisis, as we all know. Like, we yeah. all know people affected with mental health. So if we... If, if, but if you have a purpose and you have a... And you're, you feel like you're making a contribution, regardless yeah. of how small that might be, then then you are going to be happy and healthy, not necessarily wise. But, you know... So for me, it's been a slow realisation that if I'm putting information out to the world that I think is useful to some people... Yeah. Then, then, then that makes me feel good about myself, as well as makes me feel like I'm making a contribution to society. It's like good for me, good for the planet. And, which, um, have, which is great. Yeah. 
Uh, think... without, being, without being too self-important or too wanky about it, it's like, you know, you can argue it's a bit, it's a selfish thing too. It's like, yeah, if you feel good, then, you know, then it keep doing it. Do you think people will, like, in 20 years or 50, 2050, come back and think, wow, the war on waste, that, like, changed the world? And, like, do you think people will be doing that? Or oh, you... man, I'm not nearly, I'm, I mean, you know, I'm not nearly vain enough to think the war on waste <laughs> can change the world at all. I'd be the most overblown, egotistical, um, di- divorced. But it has, it has, but it has. It started off all these movements, right? Which is essentially... It has had a big impact in the sort of tiny... I guess the tiny world that we live in, you know, in our kind of, in, in my kind of world, I guess it has had a big impact. And, and I'm, and I'm really excited about the impact and I'm proud of it. And I think, um, it's definitely had this ripple effect bigger and beyond the normal people that just watch television documentaries. Yeah. So I think that's a really good thing. And I think we've started conversations that otherwise may not have happened. But there are lots of people, I'm sure you're probably talking to some of them in your podcast, who've been working on this stuff for, like, decades, mm. you know, like Tim Silverwood, the, the, yeah. um, the, I know you guys probably know, and know Laura knows. You know, he's been working, and he said to me, God, Steve, you've made more impact in your three weeks of the television program than I've been able to generate, and all of my NGO buddies, and, you know, in That's 20, true, though. That's 20 so years of campaigning. Yeah. I was like, yeah, but that... That, yeah, you might think that's true, but what you guys have done is you've laid the groundwork. People know we haven't come up with things that have been completely unheard of before. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to try and take that kind of credit away from yeah. people that have been doing the hard yards over and over again for years and years. We've still, you know, what we still, uh, we've been used, we've used the power of television. It's still the most important. I still believe it. Television is the most powerful medium when it's done right. You know, like it, it's still the most the most effective tool for communication. So we've v- just v- been able to v- harness v- that. Uh, when I say television, I mean visual content. It doesn't really matter what you're watching. Oh, like on. YouTube to everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the way to communicate is through screen yeah, storytelling. Yeah. You know, like, it doesn't... Yeah, I mean, these days, how you watch it, whether it's on a laptop, phone, TV, yeah. irrelevant, really, to me. And has ABC changed? Because uh, did I hear a stat like uh, it was the most shared show ever on ABC or something like that? War and Waste. Well, that banana clip that went that was on the ABC Facebook page was has now been watched I think twenty three million times and is the most yeah the most viewed piece of content shared by ABC ever. That's awesome. And why do you think that clip? Like why? Because people everyone loves bananas. <laughs> well, but bananas apparently. I've also got mates that work in the supermarkets that are marketing director, like Aldi and others that work there, and they say bananas is the number one product sold in the supermarkets in Australia. So yeah, we so yeah we are bananas for bananas. We literally <laughs> love bananas. I, I, it's bizarre, but we, we do. need to talk right? to someone who makes grows bananas. Why not? Well, everyone. But I think so. The, why did that work so well? Because it was such a scandalous no-brainer of outrage. <laughs> yeah. It was, a, you know, yeah. the outrage of hardworking Aussie farmer, yeah. and it was a, re- and she was a sympathetic female farmer who was visibly moved by what she has to do every day, which is throw away these beautiful bananas that she has grown for like eighteen months, yeah. and it just gets chucked in a giant pile because. Because the supermarkets say they're not pretty or enough or small enough or big enough or bendy yeah. enough. You know, that is just the, the insanity of that, I think, really hit home. That, 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 that there are farmers out there trying to make food for us, but are being told we don't want that food because it's not perfect enough, even though it's totally delicious. That, I think, really hit home to just the, the Aussie, especially the Aussie sense of the fair go. You know, like that, that is just not giving the farmer a fair go, it's, it's blaming us for being yeah. fussy when we've got no knowledge or choice of it. And we know that there are people going starving in the world and we're just throwing food away because we're told that well, apparently we don't want to eat it because it's the wrong size. It's like, I think just the collection of outrage of that story was really, really strong and powerful. And yeah. people, really read, people really responded to it. Considering it had such an amazing impact for the ABC, has it changed the mindset of workers at the ABC or anything <coughs> in how they utilise their waste or, you know, any... Any yeah, different? it has, it has. You have to have your own house in order, you know, you can't, people in glass houses can't throw stones, right? So you just, 
yeah, there was the, the ABC has this sort of corporate governance thing that even when whatever show we're doing, I'm doing this beautiful show at the moment about getting people with um, autism and Asperger's um, into the workplace. People that never had a friend or let alone a job, getting them actually a job. And some of them are just utterly brilliant. So we have to have, well, what are, what's the ABC doing to actually find genuine employment for people on, on the spectrum, that kind of thing. So, and with waste, yeah, absolutely. We had to do an audit about our own recycling processes internally at the ABC. And yeah, so there is, a, there is you know, the, the good thing about the ABC is it does have, takes that responsibility really seriously. So uh, the, the other thing is it, because it actually was really successful in terms of the ratings, which is how TV is always judged, you know, like it's being held up as the kind of the poster child of the, the modern ABC. It's like, you know, we got a podcast, we made a podcast, we did um, we had lots of local radio all over Australia, do stories on it. We had like clothes swap events. We had social media videos. We did like, you know, online surveys. We did, it was just like what, what, what's been described as a pan ABC initiative. So it's like using the power and the reach of the ABC across the whole of Australia. So now it's just like, okay, so what's the next one? What's the next one? You know, like we want another one like that. So it's kind of the pressure to actually deliver another series like that is, is pretty full on. What do you think but, the next topic would be for something like that? You got any ideas? Uh, I do have a few ideas. Um, I want to do more War and Waste because there's a whole load more topics. I think one of the topics we didn't really cover properly, for example, is water bottles. You know, I think, yeah. you know, with, like having a reusable water bottle now instead of those plastic bottles, you know, that's a big one that we haven't done. Um, E-waste, you know, the built-in obsolescence, you know, that people like Apple make sure that you have to have a different cable charger for your laptop each year and all that kind of crazy stuff. Like what happens to all those, all that, all that electronic yeah. stuff. And, and and that's not just com Apple computers and phones. That's like, you know, dishwashers and toasters and kettles and all that stuff. So we've got, that's a huge story. So I want to tackle that story as well. Like car tires having to change those all so often what happens to all that like there's a there's a there's a lot of waste so i want to do stuff on that um uh a few other ideas i want to actually help you do something possibly on um just like life living like houses and how you actually you personally can make sure your house is more sustainable not just buying it and not just paying someone to put solar panels but actually what I'm about is trying to empower the individual to do it themselves, you know, to actually be a bit more knowledgeable, to be informed. I don't know how to fix anything. I'm hopeless, you know, but I, I want to show, show how you can actually become a much more productive citizen on your own. And, you know, and I guess the main thing for me is about making people feel positive and fun about it, you know, like not, not beating people over the head. That's been my main thing. I want to do these shows that actually you feel good about being a part of you don't just go oh, better you don't want to guilt trip people or shame them into doing anything the that said can... that said i have i do cut shame people in the lift at the abc now and i coin <laughs> it I'm, I'm gonna cut shame you now because you've got a disposable cut what do you say but, do you know that it's bad for the environment I, yeah i just go oh where's your keep cut where's you bring your own coffee cup which is exactly what i don't do professionally like no, you just cannot, my girlfriend just doesn't talk to me when i say that it's super angry. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's just the worst kind of communication. So I'm actually that's sort of just a bad personal habit I'm trying to eradicate from my own life, which is like making people feel guilty. We, yeah, 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 it's interesting, isn't it? But um, oh, like has ABC changed though since the warm race? Like, do you guys all have a did ABC buy everyone a keep cup or a reusable cup? I that's, I actually asked them to buy it to give everyone a a keep cup and they yeah. were like oh we've no, actually I... got we've actually got 400 leftover radio national cups that we're going to give out and four, and some triple j ones and um <laughs> you know and i was like oh but it doesn't say one way so it's like yeah but we it's all about reuse right Recycling. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't we couldn't sell them at the beginning so now we're just give, but i haven't seen any of them i don't know how many if that was true or not but yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know they don't really like spending money where they don't need to so you know, there's been a lot more people walking around the building with their... With their Have you had people, down. like like industry people and stuff, come and, like, try and see you guys or get mad at you, like, or bombard you? Like, how do you show our bananas? 
I was, oh, I'm much more on the on both the fish and the meat series than on the oh, really? race one. Oh, the meat one was brutal. I mean, they just did not want us to make the show. And, the, you know, the big chicken meat federation and the Australian pork limited. Uh-huh. They do not They do not want you to know that they, you know, there's a reason why they're in out of sight and out of mind, these giant intensive indoor sheds where, yeah. I, mean, it, I mean, they are horrific, I have to say. I don't want to. I don't want you to, you guys, your listeners to switch off, but, you know, once you've been inside a chicken farm or a pig farm, an intensive factory farm, if that is a that is a sight and a smell that you can, you will never forget. And they do not want you to, they do not want many people to have that experience because if you have that experience, you won't have the sausage sizzle at Bunnings, you won't have a bacon sandwich, you won't have a chicken burger, you won't go to KFC. Like, I, I mean, you just won't do it because it is really confronting. So they do anything in their power to not give you access. We didn't get access to the, the most intensive chicken and pig farms in that show. We got access to the what the industry regarded as the good ones. And if you watch that show, you'll still go, oh, my God, that is confronting. And it was confronting. And that's the good one. Yeah, that's so, what I found from, from those episodes, especially the chicken one. Even though yeah. it was like they were doing it to best practice, it was still... That was best practice. That was the RSPCA yeah. approved to chicken farm. Oh, that's the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals approving that chicken farm. I mean, that's how... I mean, that and to, to describe it for people, these chickens, like they really don't have any room to move and people were trying to justify, well, you know, it's fine. They've got... They, they can that's, kind of shuffle. <laughs> they, could, they can shuffle about, uh, you know, three centimetres, which is two and a half centimetres more than the other ones can shuffle. Yeah. You're like, I mean, really? Uh, seriously, it was that. So that was that was the most backlash we've had. That was really oh, interesting. Long. But you did get that Mexican restaurant to change, didn't you? Yeah, Guzman and Gomez. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do we you got free those. Mexican for life now? <laughs> <laughs> I've got fifty percent off for life. There you go. <laughs> what what did you did you actually get a few perks from doing the war on waste? Like was there perks out of this? You're not allowed. You're not. You know the ABC are very strict at that kind of stuff. Oh, okay. not, no, yeah. No, so even if I did, I wouldn't tell you. But no, okay. I didn't. <laughs> yeah. No, I did. I didn't at all. No, zero perks. Absolutely zero perks. I think I might have got. No, I didn't even get a key card. I was going to say I think I might have been sent this. Frank Green keep oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. but I didn't. I paid. I bought it. Frank, I bought so, it. Frank thought that would be a good offer. Good person to send one to. <laughs> he sent one to Craig Rudcastle, our presenter. Oh, he okay. sent one to him. Nice. Yeah, that was. But that there is. Uh, there's very little perks working in public service broadcasting. What? What is there? Certain things like you wish you could do a doco on, but ABC you just wouldn't do. Like you just okay. know. They just wouldn't touch it. Oh, that's a good question. I mean, yeah, there are there are there are things that the ABC won't touch. You know, I, I would like them to. I would, you know, I'd like to be more radical about some of the things that we like do. Like what? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually am really interested in doing something on um, corporate greed and corporate donations. Like, the, oh, the, interesting. The, yeah, like financial industry. It's like the four biggest banks own more money than the, or make more money than the top fifty or five hundred companies in Australia, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and no one talks about that. The two main political parties who are just constantly donated by their people in return for you know lobbying powers and yeah, you know, like it's absolutely outrageous. So I was, I was having a chat with someone this morning about this exact idea, and that's going to be a hard one to get over the line at the ABC, but. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm thinking about how to give it a go. You know, the chairman's probably the chairman on WeSpec or something. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, so you just like the web of the web of sort of corruption. And I just think if you can genuinely try and do shows that are in the interest of the public, of the everyday person, rather than in the kind of status quo of the of the, of the have. The, what about supermarkets? Have-have? Do you feel like there's a a chance to a good docker on supermarkets or not really? Uh, yeah, I think there is. I mean, it's hard enough even getting them to talk on War and Waste. It's hard enough getting yeah, them to yeah. talk. It was really hard getting them to talk on, on, on What's the Catch and For the Love of Meat. Like, supermarkets are very wary. They put up their very boring spokesperson, you know. <laughs> do you strategize it? Do you like think, oh, maybe I'll start playing golf and join the Royal Sydney Golf Club? <laughs> 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 Have a few rounds and do a dog on the side? <laughs> uh, Look, I have to admit, 
Golf, golf is one of my twice a year guilty pleasures. I, oh, I'm not. I'm not proud to admit it. And my wife hates golf. everything about golf. She really. She's embarrassed that her husband's ever a pick up a golf club. But right. I do. I do occasionally whack a golf ball around to sort. Of, and I actually like it. But um, <laughs> but I don't admit that to anybody. Certainly yeah, yeah. not the ABC. It really doesn't fit with my image at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> You've got way too much out of me. <laughs> this is great this is what we want well okay so I guess essentially you're a storyteller in a way yeah. that's factual and stories are so important and I mean I find that they're the best way to get a message across and people are so engaged in stories so how important do you think storytelling is going to be in 2050 because at the moment where I think the Pew um, Institute did this research article that Right now, we are the most polarized and divided we've ever been in history, and people just aren't listening anymore. So there's, well, there's too much information. Yeah, about like that. in 2050, is storytelling going to be just as important then and as it is today? Absolutely, totally. Yes, I think storytelling is an intrinsic human need. I don't even think it's just a luxury or a desire. It is an absolute need. Like sitting around the campfire telling stories, and you know, you only have to know a very cursory amount. Of knowledge of the indigenous culture to know how important storytelling is and the dream part. And in every single culture, I studied anthropology at university, and the study of cultures and people, tribes and religions all around the world. And storytelling is an absolute uniform, essential part of the identity of every single culture on earth. Like we, stories is, is, is what is what keeps us going. So there's absolutely no doubt, yes. Do, do you think like, like War and Waste would have been as successful as it was without like YouTube. No, I think I think um, things like that little um, banana video, like the way that that went, that literally went viral everywhere, has really helped get people to go, "Oh, that's interesting." What you know, where did it come from? And they realised yeah. it came from a long form documentary series that they might not normally ever bother watching. And so, yeah, I think the two forms of short form digital kind of our all videos on social media and YouTube and everywhere else really can serve to actually make more people watch the kind of long form, more complex storytelling that I like to do. Yeah. So yeah, I think I think the two can work hand in hand together. You just have to have a plan. You have to have a strategy. You have to yeah. work out how you can make the two work. And I think I think that I don't think that. Some people say TV is dead or documentary is dead. I mean, I just don't agree at all. It's all it's story, what, it's, what are the it's key parts there. of these docos? Like, obviously, you have a Craig Rucastle like figure as a key part. You need a guy like you on there as a key part. You need, yeah, like, can you I, do. Can yeah, I be yeah, shooting yeah. these docos yeah. just on an iPhone or? I think I think it's I think you you know storytelling is a craft. You know, like, you know, some people are naturally good at it, some people are not good at it, but some people can learn it. And I think um, you need to know how to tell a good story. And that involves who's telling the story on screen, who's doing it on screen, having someone like the front man, like Craig, who's like funny and energetic and, you know, unafraid to make himself look like a bit of a goose at times and also ask really smart questions at other times and being able to decide when and how and when, what, what, what approach to take is crucial. So... Yeah, you, the, the, it, there, there's probably more goes into making these shows than most people realise who are not in the industry. So, you know, like, yes, there are, there are several components. And there's also luck in the end of the day, you know, you need something to just take hold. Yeah. But as you get more experience making this kind of stuff, you get a sense of a little story. I mean, I knew the banana story was powerful. I knew, yeah. I, so my job at the ABC, I wasn't the director of War and Waste. But I was the ABC commissioning editor, and I just knew I wanted that story up front in the first episode because it would put people in. You know? yeah. So, in terms of the structure of how you structure the episode, you know, that's the sort of thing that I, I have input into. And um, but War and Waste had a really good director, had two good directors on it, and a, a really strong research team and a really great presenter. And yeah. you know, there, there was good people involved. So um, that's great. Yeah, the ta the ta there's a few parts, a few components to put it together, and some of you can you, you can get it right some of the time. Some of the time you think you've got it right, and you haven't. Other times you thought you got it wrong, and it ends up going well. So, yeah. but it's fun. It's a really fun fun thing to do. I would urge people to be storytellers. We need them. I was going to say, is is it factual storytelling an occupation you'd want your kids to go into? Yeah. 
Totally. And my kids love stories too. I mean, I read them stories every night and they love them. You know, like, and I love that. I love that they love them and I feed that. I think if you love story, then you, you're you never going to be bored or lonely in your life, you know, if you, yeah. if you love yeah. story. Steve, it's been awesome to chat to you. Thank it's been you. great talking to you guys too. Yeah. Thank you. Got lots of good things. I, know, I feel like we'll have to have you on again because you're, you're, you're one of the smarter like, guys I've ever talked to. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Stop blushing. Ooh, it. No, it's good. It's been good to talk to you, and I'd love to come and talk to you again if you have, if you once yours is the most successful podcast of all time. You I know. Remember me. What are the essentials? Give, it, give us the three essentials. Keep it funny, make it relevant, you know, surprise people, have a sense of humour, don't take yourselves too seriously. It's all about the guests, not about you. I have orchid earrings on. And have all have all <laughs> earrings. Yeah. <laughs> Don't take myself very seriously at all. Why not? No, no, you guys, you got all, you got all the ingredients. Thanks. <laughs> no worries. Good to talk oh, to you. Thanks, yeah, thanks so much, Steve. Keep it was good to meet you. Goals. Yeah. yeah. Cheers. 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 Bye. Bye. Bye.